it's worth really considering like why do we build technology in the first place and fundamentally it's to improve humanity to improve human lives to be able to achieve more and i think that we're really seeing that unfolding right now hi i'm reed hoffman and i'm aria finger we want to know what happens if in the future everything breaks humanity's way we're speaking with visionaries in every field, from climate science to criminal justice, and from entertainment to education. These conversations also feature another kind of guest, GPT-4, OpenAI's latest and most powerful language model to date. Each episode will have a companion story, which we've generated with GPT-4 to spark discussion. You can find these stories down in the show notes. In each episode, we seek out the brightest version of the future and learn what it'll take to get there. This is possible. So Arya, this is obviously one of the things we've been looking forward to uh, for quite some time. We both know that this year, 2023, is going to be in many ways a year of amplification intelligence through AI, and that one of the driving drum beats is what's going on with OpenAI, with ChatGPT, with GPT-4. And I couldn't be more excited to talk to Sam Altman and Greg Brockman because they are two of the folks who, in the very earliest days, started thinking about like, okay, what are going to be the implications of this? How do we elevate humanity? How do we shape what's possible? How do we avoid um, possible highly negative impacts? This conversation is just going to be super interesting. I mean, it feels like the most natural uh, episode to have. When we launched Possible with Trevor Noah, we said this was going to be a conversation with him where we talked about GPT-4. And in each of our episodes, whether it was with Dr. Kim Udell or Saul Griffiths, we always had GPT-4 weighing in and creating these stories and positing what the future would look like. And so it feels so natural to bring it home with Sam and Greg, who are part of the team at OpenAI, of course, that created ChatGPT and created GPT-4. And I'm, I'm particularly excited to talk to them because all of our episodes have been about how to improve humanity, whether it's how to create a sustainable energy future or how to create the future of cities and when Sam and Greg talk about AI, they're not doing it for technology's sake. They say, how can AI improve humanity and improve the world? And so it's lovely to hear their point of view on how this incredible technology can be used in such a human way, as you mentioned. And obviously, with all of the worldwide excitement about ChatGPT and everything else, everyone may know this. But for our listeners who might not, Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI and chairman of Helion, and was formerly the president of Y Combinator, an American technology startup accelerator. Greg Brockman is the president and co-founder of OpenAI. He co-led the development of OpenAI's bot, which actually co-runs the company day to day. He's also a board member of Stellar, a nonprofit foundation making a blockchain for moving money across borders for a fraction of a penny. Here's our conversation with Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. Sam and Greg, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, um, not just because we've done so much work together, but also because um, in terms of people who have most informed my own perspectives on AI in the future, you uh, are both vying for number one in that list. So this is, this is awesome. Welcome to our podcast, Possible. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. So why don't we start with a baseline. Say a little bit about what your open AI mission is. Like what is the what is the true north that informs all of the decisions that you guys drive to? And Sam, why don't we start with you? But I want to hear from Greg on this too. We are trying to develop and deploy beneficial, safe AGI for all of humanity. And that is a unprecedented projects. It is uh, difficult to always know that we're doing the right thing. We will make many missteps along the way, but that's what we're guided towards. I very deeply believe this will be the most 
positively transformative technology that humanity has yet developed. And it will, you know, to the degree that this is the technology that helps us invent all future technologies, I think it'll be a super bright future. You know, we started OpenAI, Reed, as you remember, almost eight years ago, because I think we all had the sense that AI was really going to happen. And not immediately. It's been a long process. And I think there's a long process in front of us still. But I think that this technology is something that we have the opportunity to influence how it plays out. I think that this can be the most positive force, and that's something that we want to contribute to. And so our vision is that AGI, which I think is also kind of going to be a spectrum, is beneficial to all of humanity, and that we operationalize that in a lot of ways. And I think we've learned so much from the very early days where we kind of had this grand mission, but didn't know how to connect it to actual tactical execution. And over the years, we figured out how to build a structure, how to kind of bake our values into that structure, how to actually build systems that are useful. Like it's been really wonderful to see how over the past just couple months that kind of a lot of our technology has gone mainstream and people are starting to get the kinds of benefits we've always hoped for. But there's still a lot left to be done. Like we're still sort of in the very early days of this technology. But I think it's also one of the things that we really believe is like everyone needs to have a stake in it. Everyone needs to have a say and figuring out how to really get to global governance and have sort of representative input into what these systems do. We think that's just as important as any of the technical pieces. And having been there in the early days with you guys, I know this is something you held as fiercely and boldly eight years ago uh, as today. Walk us through a little bit about how, you know, there's 8 billion people in the world, you know, and you might say there is one plus billion in the economically advantaged middle class. How is the AGI mission that OpenAI is working toward going to benefit the other 7 billion? Yeah, so I think that I think that one important force in AI is going to be about access. Like we really think that giving everyone access to this technology to be able to better their lives, use it for their purpose, to be able to kind of get their preferences and their feedback into that system to represent them. I think that's going to be a baseline. And you know that there's a lot of questions about how exactly this technology will play out. Like I think we've seen other technologies that act as this sort of centralizing force of you know, that it does kind of raise all the tide, but somehow the outliers really end up more centralized. And so that's part of how we've structured our company, that we're a capped profit, so that if there is this great centralization of, of capital into OpenAI, that actually it's not owned by the shareholders. It ends up being owned by a nonprofit for distribution to the world. And so I think that there are exotic outcomes here where it, that you kind of think about things like UBI and, you know, sort of distribution that way. Um, but I think that fundamentally that the core of giving everyone this enabling technology that lowers the barriers to creating, to expressing your creativity, to accomplishing new tasks and pushing forward humanity for, on whatever problem you care about and are passionate about, like that I think is the real key. A, a thing that I really deeply believe is that maybe all real sustainable economic growth comes from technological progress. And I think we have somewhat, and, and maybe the sort of the social, socio-political institutions and culture that help us get that technological progress. And so the way that I think what we're doing helps the the other 7 billion people is not, not that different. I, I mean, it'll hopefully be greater in magnitude than previous technologies, but it's technology is kind of how we lift everybody up. Talk a little bit about education, medicine, you know, like... What are some of the advances there that you could see across the entire world? Because I, you know, I think we see line of sight to some of those right now. Yeah, I think education for me is one that I'm extremely interested in. Actually, if we weren't going to uh, successfully start an AI company, one of my backups was to do a programming education company. Because I think the way that you teach people today, like everyone has a story about that one teacher who really understood them, who took the time to get to know them, learn what motivated them, and, you know, just like really inspired them to do more. And imagine if you could give that kind of teacher to every student 24 seven, whenever they want for free, like it's still a little bit science fiction, but it's much less science fiction than it used to be. And you can look at things like Khan Academy, who are really starting to take GPT-4 and deploy it in the classroom and really figure out how to steer this technology so that it's a helpful tutor. That If a kid asks for it, oh, just do my homework for me, it'll say, no, 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 I don't do that but tries to probe to figure out what they're excited about and how to, how to really motivate them. And so I think that this kind of technology of just reaching global scale and figuring out how do you get the best out of people 
Like that is the realm that we're starting to enter now. One question I'd ask about the education, because I think that's like, I love that what you all are dreaming of is bringing education to everyone and bringing everyone to economic opportunity. I think a lot of people might say, well, we've had that already. We have Khan Academy, we have Coursera, we have all these online classes that like we're supposed to be this promise. And we didn't see the realization. Like, why do you both, and um, Greg, I'm happy to go to you since you brought it up. Like, why do you think this actually will be the step change for the millions and billions of people who don't have the education that they need right now? Yeah, I think that AI in general is this field of broken promises, right? If you look over the course of 70 years, everyone feels the potential, right? Because how is it that we get education at all, right? It's through people who are smart, who you know, are able to actually help break down problems for us and teach us things. And imagine if you could have a machine that could do that, that could help with that. And I think that we've been sort of building a lot of body, right? We've built like these virtual assistants, the, you know, the, the Alexis in the series, we've built a lot of these applications like the Khan Academies who, that they have the reach that they're talking to the students, but the question of the brain, like, how do you actually have a machine that's able to get this amplification, that's able to be the technology that can be this force multiplier and what people can do? And that's what we've been missing. And so the real question, I I guess the test of what we've been building is, will it cross that chasm? Will it achieve it? And I think that we clearly have gone beyond what many people thought possible. Like there's no question that the capabilities of something like GPT-4 are just, like I think everyone who sees it, you, you really see that I did not think computers could do this, but now they can. And I think that there's a second step that's also important, which is not just having the raw knowledge, but can we really steer the machine to do the, the tasks that we want to reflect our intent and to sort of operate according to the values that that society chooses to put into that machine. And I think all of that technology, that's what we're working on, that we're building. But I think that also the fact that there's this whole deployment apparatus that's almost just waiting for the right brain to appear, um, that's going to be equally important. So I think we have a shot. It's not guaranteed, but I think that the test will be the next couple of years. What have some of the surprises that have come with scale? Some of them you already just mentioned, Greg, which was, you know, the the fact that it got much more capable than maybe many people would expect it, although it was part of the kind of the R&D thesis of a number of smart people and the whole team you guys have assembled at OpenAI to say scale, um, you know, kind of really matters here and can generate a bunch of capabilities. But what have been some of the surprises? And, and maybe, Greg, we'll start with you and then Sam will kick it over to you. Well, I'll tell you the very first surprise. This was all the way back in 2017 when we created this paper called the unsupervised sentiment neuron. And it didn't get much attention at the time, but for us, it was the real wake-up call that you really need to pursue this paradigm. You know, we trained a model to predict just the next character in Amazon reviews. And you expect it's going to learn where the commas go, where the uh, the nouns are, where the verbs are. But the amazing thing was it learned a state-of-the-art sentiment analysis classifier. It could tell you if a review was positive or negative. And so you see that semantics emerged from a syntactic process. Like, where did the meanings come from? We never told the machine the meanings. It just somehow figured it out by pursuing this task. And so I think that this this story of, oh, the machine will never learn X. It can never learn to do mathematics. It can never learn algorithms. Each one of these things we've really seen fall. And so it's not perfect. We still have a long way to go. It's still early days. But I think that the fact that we're able to, you know, start solving, like, I think programming is maybe the, uh, the, for me, the, it's so interesting to see how many people have gotten this giant boost. People who have never programmed before are able to start getting into the field, but people who are excellent programmers can do more, can accomplish more. And uh, and I think that reaching this level of capability where it actually accelerates my coding workflow, I I couldn't do it with the initial co-pilot, but with GPT-4, absolutely happens. Could you say a little bit before we hop over to Sam on this, around what the acceleration of your coding capabilities look like? Because I think most people kind of go, well, is it some, Is is it like, you know, you know, Greg's now in the back seat. Like, what, what is the shape of that co-piloting? It's actually very interesting because you don't normally think about your tasks in terms of all the mechanical pieces, right? You just sort of think like, okay, I'm going to like write this program. And then you don't really think about the fact that you're decomposing into all these pieces. You're like actually typing a bunch of things. A bunch of your time is spent remembering exactly which libraries do the functions you already are looking for, how to like impose them, exactly what the arguments are. And you start to realize that this high level task of like, I want to build a system or an app or whatever it is you want to do is suddenly turning into a sequence of keystrokes. And many of those keystrokes, they're actually just boilerplate. They're just rote. So 
the early co-pilot kinds of applications really were, if there's boilerplate, I'll take care of it for you. And, you know, the model starts to get a little bit better. If you don't quite know a specific programming language or you don't know a specific set of libraries, the model will happily supply those because it has almost this like, it just experienced so much. It's seen so many different varieties of things. And so it kind of knows, oh yeah, in this context, this plugs in. But what's so interesting with GPT-4 is that it starts to even move higher up where it's like, okay, there's an error message and these error messages, they're super obscure, right? Sometimes you search around for them. You, you look on various websites, like you try to piece together from what other people have said and that no one gets exactly the same error message that you have. You just have to like, kind of like, you know, pattern match against what's there. And GPT-4 just kind of knows, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you forgot to use the nest async IO library in Jupyter, you know, like that level of sophistication is now starting to be possible. And so there's just a lot of like just common mistakes, but also now common patterns. And, you know, sometimes even just creative ideas, like my favorite application actually of GPT-4, mostly for fun, but sometimes can be quite useful, is to summarize code as a poem. And you actually get real insights about what that code is doing. And it's really fun to read it. Here's a poem from your files, Greg. I'll link to the code that inspired it in the episode's show notes. In a world where code intertwines, APIs dance and data shines. A request is made, a response appears. In the language of Python, our logic steers. Through headers and methods, we pave our way. Asynchronous calls in a synchronous day. With sessions and streams, the code unwinds. A masterpiece of tech where brilliance binds. And that's just something that I was never going to write a poem. I've never read a poem about code that was written by a human, but somehow the AI written ones are just quite compelling. Sam, surprises of scale. I just looked up a quote to read. It's from Noam Shazir. And the quote is, we offer no explanation as to why these architectures seem to work. We attribute their success as all else to divine benevolence. And that has been like somewhat of a recurring theme for me. I, I very much think of myself as an empiricist. So if something works and it predictably works better, if you do more of it, even if you can't have like a perfect explanation, I, I feel like very confident in trusting the curve. Um, but when you step back and look at the whole thing from that unsupervised sentiment neuron that Greg mentioned, that's like quite mysterious why that should work. It, you know, it's like hard. I challenge anyone to give a very rigorous down to the middle explanation of what's happening all the way through there to like how some of the stuff that GPT-4 does starts to emerge to really why like gradient descent should work as well as it does at all. I have made peace with it. I totally believe in it. I think it's going to go super far. But it is, you know, it was surprising when it started to work. I'll say that. Like, even before we started OpenAI, uh, when we just like, you know, observed the the AlexNet result, that felt like magic to me. I, I, I went to school at a time when they told you if you wanted to study machine learning as a student, that the only way to like be guaranteed to have a dead end career was to work on neural networks. I want to shift gears a little bit. One of the things I really appreciate about both of you is that you're so open to being wrong. I don't know what's going to happen. We need to ask other people. We are not the only people who have the answers. And Sam, a few weeks ago on Twitter, I think someone snarkily tweeted at you like, well, next thing you're going to say, we should regulate AI. And you were like, yeah, yeah, we should regulate AI. <laughs> and so my question for you is, how do you see that happening? How do you see a lot of people are saying, oh, you're moving too quickly. Um, wh what would you call for in terms of either regulation or global governance or bringing people in? I, I think there's a lot of anxiety and fear right now. And I always believe people when they're afraid or mad or whatever, even though I don't think people can always explain the reason I think people feel afraid of the rate of change right now. A lot of the update that people at OpenAI, who work at OpenAI, have been grappling with for many years, a lot of the rest of the world is going through in a few months. And it's very understandable to feel a lot of anxiety in that moment. Look, we think that moving with great caution is super important. And I think there's a big regulatory role there. Um, I don't think a 
pause in the naive sense is likely to help that much. Uh, you know, we spent way more than six months, by the way, not way more, somewhat more than six months uh, aligning GPT-4 and safety testing it and red teaming it since we, since we finished training. So like taking the time on that stuff is important, but really I think what we need to do is figure out what regulatory approach, what set of rules, what safety standards will actually work, will actually in the messy contact with reality work, uh, and then figure out how to get that to be the sort of regulatory posture of the world. You know, when people always focus on their fears, a little bit like Sam, you were saying earlier, they tend to say, slow down, stop, et cetera. And that tends to, I think, um, make a bunch of mistakes. One mistake is uh, we're kind of supercharging a bunch of industries and, you know, you want that, you want the benefit of that supercharging industry. I think that the, another thing is, is I think that one of the things we've learned with larger scale models is we get alignment better. So like the questions around safety and safety precautions are better in the future in some very arguable sense than now. Uh, and so with care, with voices, with governance, with, you know, spending months, you know, safety testing, I think the ultimate regulatory thing that I've been suggesting has been something that's along the lines of being able to remediate the harms from your models. So like if something shows up that's, that's particularly bad or in, you know, in close anticipation, you can change it. That's something I've already seen you guys doing pre-regulatory framework, but obviously getting that into a more collective regulatory framework so that, you know, preferably everywhere in the world uh, can, can sign on with that is the kind of thing that I think is a vision. Do you have any, any things you, you guys would add to that for when people think about what should be the way that people are participating? You, you touched on this, but to, to really echo it, a, a thing we believe in very strongly is that keeping the rate of change in the world relatively constant rather than say, go build AGI in secret and then deploy it all at once when you're done is much better. This idea that people relatively gradually have time to get used to this incredible new thing that is going to transform so much of the world, get a feel for it, have time to update, you know, institutions and people do not update very well overnight. Um, to be part of its evolution, to provide critical feedback, to tell us when we're doing dumb mistakes, to find the areas of great benefit and potential harm, um, to make our mistakes and, and learn our lessons when the stakes are lower than they will be in the future, uh, although we still would like to avoid them as much as we can, of course. Uh, and I don't just mean we, I mean like the, the field as a whole sort of understanding, with, as with any new technology, where the tricky parts are going to be. Um, give Greg a lot of credit for pushing on this, especially when it's been hard, but it is, I think it is the way to make a new technology like this safe. And it is messy. It is difficult. Um, it is, it means we have to like say a lot of times, Hey, we don't know the answer or Hey, we were wrong there. But relative to any alternative, um, I think this is the best way for society to not only get to the safest outcome, but for the voices of the all of society to have a chance to shape this all rather than just being the people that, you know, would work in a secret lab. And we've really grappled with this question over time. Like when we started OpenAI, really thinking about how to get from where we were starting, which was kind of nothing in a lot of ways, uh, to a safe AGI that's deployed that actually benefits all of humanity. Like, how do you connect those two? How do you actually get there? And I think that the sort of plan, like the, the plan that Sam kind of alludes to of like just being like, hey, you just kind of build it in secret and then you deploy it one day. There's a lot of people who really advocate for it. And it has some nice properties that means that, you know, that like, oh, I think a lot of people look at it and say, hey, uh, there's a technical safety problem of making sure the AI can even be steered. And there's a society problem. And that second one sounds really hard, but you know, I know technology, so I'll do just focus on this first one. And that, that original plan has the property that you can do that. But that never really sat well with me because I think that you need to solve both of these problems for real, right? How do you even know that like your, you know, that your safety process actually worked? You don't want it to be that, that, that when 
you know, that you get one shot to get this thing right. And so I think that, look, like there's a lot to still learn. We're still in, in, in very much the early days here. But I think that this process that we've gone through over the past four or five years now of starting to deploy this technology and learn has taught us so much. And we really weren't in a position three, four years ago to patch issues. You know, when there was an issue with GPT-3, we would sort of patch it in the way that GPT-3 was deployed with filters, with sort of, you know, non-model level interventions. And now we're starting to mature from that. We're actually able to do model level interventions. And it is definitely the case that GPT-4 itself is really critical in all of our safety pipelines and being able to actually sort of even understand what's coming out of the model in an automated fashion. GPT-4 does an excellent job of this kind of thing. And so I think that there's a lot that we are learning and that this process of doing iterative deployment has been really critical to that. That teased me up really well for my next question. So you said just a few years ago, you had nothing. It was just the beginning. And so it takes like a lot to go right and and maybe some luck to, uh, with just a few hundred people, outpace the biggest tech companies in the world to get where you are today. I would love to hear about like, what is the magic that has led to that, Sam? Are there key leaders within OpenAI? How did you get to this incredible place knowing that it is just the beginning and there's so much further to go? I, I think there's a bunch of things that we have done, some intentionally and some that we got lucky on. One big one is I think we've built a culture of, and this is another thing I'll credit Greg for, uh, of really sweating the details and, and trying to get the details right and bringing people in who want to work that way um, and doing you know very careful engineering, very careful science and letting that compound over a long period of time. Another is, I think we're a pretty truth-seeking or we, we just want to like find what works and do more of that. And that is different than most of the other AI research efforts that existed in the field when we started that had different incentive systems, different things they, they prioritized. And then another thing is like we, we make high conviction, concentrated bets. And so rather than spread out onto lots of things, we did stuff at the time, which was considered like unimaginable by many other AI labs. We're like, we're gonna put most of our resources into this one project, but we've studied it carefully and we think we can predict how it's gonna perform. So those are some things I would say. Greg, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, just to give some color on this this sort of uh, leaning into the to cold hard reality and thinking from first principles, I'd say in the very early days, I think Ilya and I uh, would spend like an hour a day, just we didn't really have an extra conference room. So we would go into the back server closet and uh, just sort of talk about everything and just debate everything. And lots of questions about who we should be hiring. Like, do you hire the traditional machine learning PhDs? Do you hire software engineers who have never done this before? Do you hire people who are somewhere in between? And then, you know, I think for each of these decisions, we got to see the consequences of them. And then we would update, we would learn. And so I think this sort of iteration, this idea of we can't know everything in advance, but we can learn from contact with reality, I think was there in our DNA from the very beginning. And even with this point of scale, like where did this hypothesis of scale come from? I mean, you can look at Dota, which was this competitive video game that we set out to solve at the beginning of 2017. OpenAI 5, an AI that plays Dota 2, a multiplayer online battle arena game with a huge cult following. In 2018, they flat out challenged OG, the reigning world champion team. And that is GG game over, OpenAI taking game two, taking the series two to zero as a player of Dota 2, as a professional. It ended up being that this was our first real scaled system and that the system got better each week as we put more compute into it. And a lot of people think, ah, that they were out to prove the scaling hypothesis, but actually it's the other way around. Our goal was actually just to run out of room on the existing algorithms so we could do new algorithm development. Like that's what we actually wanted to do. And so I think it was just really seeing the, as you're trying to pursue this direction, this other direction is pulling you along and saying, hey, hey, this is really working, that there's something here. And I think that that willingness to say, we will update, we will pivot, we will change, we will react to what we're seeing in front of us. Uh, that was very important from a technology perspective. Yeah, this this is this has basically been lost to history. So I think it's a fun example to to touch on for a minute. When we were scaling up the 
Dota project, there was like basically no one who was like, it's just going to work. It was like, eh, we don't really need know what to work on next. So we need to see where it breaks. 100%. Yeah, we had it. We had a list of three big ideas. Uh, we started on idea number one. We were so excited to work on idea number two. We really wanted to do what's called hierarchical RL, where you would like have some sort of hierarchy that, you know, you'd have long term planning and then you'd have some shorter term, like, you know, muscle movements kind of stuff. None of that ended up being necessary. The really funny thing is that we actually had just a lot of spare compute at the time. Like we had just all these CPUs sitting idle and no one had any use for them. And uh, so it was Jakob and Jamon, our, our two, two of our researchers, uh, who just would like constantly be like, all right, 2x scale this week. And then you would just see the curve. It would just get better. And I think that there's other things we've also sort of discovered, right? That there's all these scaling laws. You can find a lot of these now, these like very smooth plots as you in, you know increase the amount of compute in a model or the amount of data. And like there's so many different axes you can vary on. And they all give you these incredibly smooth exponentials. And I think there's something really deep going on that we sort of, from a scientific perspective, have been uncovering about, you know, I don't know if it's the nature of our intelligence, but certainly the nature of this artificial intelligence that we are, we are creating. I think we don't marvel at this enough because we've gotten so used to it and maybe other people don't either. But the fact that you can put in an arbitrary amount of compute for a desired level of intelligence and that seems to span an incredible range of compute and degrees of intelligence. That's like an amazing scientific discovery. It's, it is, it is pretty amazing. And I do want to say that there's something that also sometimes gets lost in the narrative here too, which is, it's not literally just, you have a bigger computer and now everything's better, right? That the sources of progress, compute data algorithms, those have been constant over many years and they remain so. Like we've also done studies on how much algorithmic progress there's been. It's a smooth exponential. And so I think that there's these inputs that you actually develop almost at small scale or across the whole industry that together combined, you put them together, the best engineering, the best systems, the best algorithmic ideas. And then that is what yields systems like GPT-4. And so I think that the one thing we should be cognizant of as we think about this, you know, these rates of progress kind of questions is really looking at where the progress comes from. And it's not any one company. It's really this like, you know, if you look at the supply chain of all of the inputs of the GPUs to all of the new algorithmic ideas to even the large scale data processing systems, like all those things together, it's pretty massive. It's lots of people involved, lots of different companies. And it's really a project of like all of humanity at, at some core, this like, you know, technological progress that's driving towards being able to deliver the systems that we're creating. So what do you think? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I think you're both wise to avoid uh, predictions in the future questions because it's, it's always sooner is stranger and different than you think. And so uh, myself having made foolish predictions and then a couple of years later going, yeah, that was, that was a foolish prediction. I knew I, when I was making it, Where, which industries and which kind of, uh, transformations of the world do you think we're full, we'll be first seeing over the next three to 10 years? Uh, we've talked about education some, we haven't talked about medicine as much, which I think is another one that will have some obvious impact. Uh, what, what are you guys seeing? I, I think that, that applying these services to law, and I think that there's a lot of benefit to be had there with giving access to legal services. And my favorite GPT-3 service was uh, a tool called uh, Augmented, which would help uh, tenants who received eviction notices understand what was in there, right? Because like many people in that demographic wouldn't necessarily have access to a lawyer and that, that you can actually help people do things that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. So that's like one example of the kinds of use cases that we're seeing work really well. Do you think there are spaces that are sort of more resistant to AI that we actually won't be seeing changes or will be sort of slower to change on that basis? Well, I think the physical world is maybe the most resistant right now. Like we ourselves had a robotics effort and a couple of years ago, we actually shut it down uh, because you know, a lot of people at the time, right, you had, we had some great field leading results. We had this cool robotics hand that was, uh, I, uh, you know, able to, to manipulate a Rubik's cube, all that good stuff. Um, but we realized that the digital world is moving so much faster. And so that team actually became our code pilot or co-pilot team. And so you can kind of see like, that was the trade is that you could actually build co-pilot and, and get that out to so many developers. 
And so I think that really figuring out how can AI help us in our physical lives. And there's many sort of crossover points, right? You think about uh, just having the ability to, if you have a pet and the pet is, uh, uh, you know, has a cone, you want to take the cone off, but you want to monitor for licking, like, can you have a webcam that is watching your pet and that an AI that notifies you whenever that happens? So I think that there will be these points that we're going to see the digital world really help in the, in the physical uh, but I think that that is actually the longer pull than many of these purely intellectual applications. I think it's going to just be sort of strange. Like, to pick one example, when when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, which some people talk about as the start of the whole AI revolution, there were a lot of predictions that chess was totally done, that no one was going to bother to play chess anymore. It was just no longer interesting. And it did affect some things and, 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 and change things. But I believe chess has never been more popular than it is today. And we don't watch AIs play each other, which would be like far more interesting games or far more like complex, better games, whatever you want to call it. Like we seem to be really interested in what other humans can do in this case. And if you're like cheating with the help of an AI and whatever else, then it's, uh, you know, like a big scandal. So, but, you know, we seem like there seems to be something deep there and a prediction that was not only wrong, but totally the opposite of what happened and what many people would have predicted. And, you know, I think that'll be true in many other cases also. Before we move on to um, some other sub subjects around kind of technology and the future possibility, because you guys in addition to leading the charge on AI or doing things also around uh, other areas, I'm curious to get your reflection on the kind of the theme of the a book uh, impromptu that, you know, when I was kind of last year when we were all playing with GPT-4, I said, okay, how do I, how do I try to show, not just tell the theory of human amplification? It's like, well, why don't I do a book with GPT-4? Uh, as a way of showing directly, here here is an amplification moment. How much do you think I'm right on the human amplification, like the amplification intelligence? And how much do you think I'm just kind of being a little too quick on it? What like what's the what's your what's your reflex on the tool amplifying hu humanity? strongly agree like that that's where we would like to push things as much as we can to go you know you don't get to push technology that much but you get to do it a little bit around the edges and thankfully in this case it seems like that's where the technology organically wants to go and i saw a tweet that stuck with me which is someone who said they they, they never thought they would get to coexist with an intelligence as powerful as gpt4 you know by the time that you got here you were like deep into the you know, the AGI land. And it turns out that it has been more possible than many people thought to build a version of AI that is really good at amplifying individual human will and making us all more productive and better at what we do. And more than that, it turns out that people really love it. You know, one of the most gratifying parts for me of OpenAI is how much people love the product and get all kinds of incredible benefits from it. And I think it's worth really considering, like, why do we build technology in the first place? And fundamentally, it's to improve humanity, to improve human lives, to be able to achieve more. And I think that we're really seeing that unfolding right now, even in the current, the current phase. And I think that even as you move to more capable systems, it's going to be extremely important to make sure that we're really architecting them for that purpose, right? That, that you have an answer for the human as the manager, the human as the end recipient, humanity as the beneficiary of this technology, like all of those things, that's part of our mission is to really make sure that we have an answer for like how humanity continues to fit in and continues to be the, the, the end beneficiary of all of these systems, kind of almost no matter how smart they get. One of the critiques of AI is the energy usage. 
And Sam, you have said that you think in the future there will not only be unlimited intelligence, but unlimited energy. And you've made significant investments in Helion. We were actually super lucky to have Dr. Uh, Kim Budell from the Lawrence Livermore Lab on uh, on an earlier episode. And she was like, we're all obsessed with her. I would love you to talk about why you invested in Fusion and how you see that playing out. Yeah, I don't think it's unlimited intelligence or energy. I think it is ever decreasing price and ever increasing abundance. But, uh, you know, we never we never get to the infinite there. I think the energy critique of these AI systems is an incredibly lowbrow critique. And it usually comes up by the time people are trying to throw everything they can in a laundry list. Um, but what I do think is abundant energy, like truly global scale, abundant, cheap, clean energy would not only have all of the obvious benefits of addressing the climate crisis and everything else in that vein, but the cost of energy is so correlated to quality of life throughout history probably more than any other single input I could think of off the top of my head, that it seems like a great thing to fund efforts trying to radically change that cost, which Helion is trying to do. And I am hopeful we'll have great news next year. And Greg, one of the things that I know we've talked education a lot, but we also talked medical. Um, and I think there's some investments you've made also in your, you know, your 1% or half percent side job as a as an angel investor, since I know how hard you work on the open AI stuff, what do you see coming in healthcare, uh, drug discovery, development, primary care, et cetera? And, and what are some of the things that you've been doing in order to enable that? Yeah. And we, we also have uh, a fund within OpenAI that invests in, in startups building on top of our technology. And so there's startups like Ambiance who are actually trying to really operationalize this. And actually, even even Microsoft is starting to deploy some of our technology through Nuance in Epic and, you know, in, in, in many hospitals. Nuance and Microsoft working together, that partnership builds my confidence that we'll really be able to meet the needs of our patients. It's going to advance this technology at a speed I don't think we would have been able to accomplish. Everything that I did here today would take me so much longer to do. This will help me be more efficient so I can spend more time actually talking to patients, looking them in the eye. To be able to gather and garner uh, insights into the patient that we may not have been to before is very exciting to me. I think that is gonna, it's gonna transform healthcare. And so I actually think that if you think about the set of problems that a doctor has, uh, that so many of them are administrative. Uh, you know, my parents are physicians. Like I hear all the stories about how they were forced to move to a world where they were sitting with an iPad as they were talking to a patient and like filling in boxes in, in Epic. Like that is not how patient care was meant to be. And so I think that we're going to move to a world, like even looking at the nuance, like instant transcription and getting, getting, getting doctor notes afterwards, where the doctor's able to actually focus on patient care and actually focus on strategy. And, you know, that there's, there's, uh, you know, some, some use cases that people are already using ChatGPT for that I think are, are very in interesting, right? So if you look, um, on, on Twitter, uh, there's someone who saved his dog's life with ChatGPT. And the story there was that he went to a vet and the vet really didn't know what to do and said, let's just observe this dog. And it just kept going downhill and still the vet didn't want to do anything different. So he presented the medical records to ChatGPT, which very correctly said, I'm not a veterinarian. Like you really need to talk to a vet, um, but was willing to give him some suggestions, some hypotheses, some, some interpretations, a brainstorm. And with that, he got the confidence to go to a second vet who was then able to run the test, save the dog's life. And I think that this is a really interesting parable because it really points to this question of like, how do we want the AI to slot in? Like you have to be so careful about over-reliance in areas like medicine, but humans aren't perfect either, right? That first doctor made a terrible call that could have had really fatal consequences. And so figuring out how to have the right humans have the right oversight. And ultimately, you know, as a patient, you actually own the outcome, right? That you have to be a medical professional, even though you're not, right? So it's like somehow our systems are not quite serving the outcomes that are required. But with AI, I think that we can provide amplification in all of these places if we get it right, if we put the right guardrails in place. How do you guys see that working? You said, like, Greg, for instance, that you are investing in OpenAI um, through OpenAI to companies that are using your platform. Like, 
is OpenAI going to be creating the change? Is it other companies that are going to be using your APIs? Like, what is the structure for all of this change that is going to happen? I know we're not allowed to predict the future, but would love to see uh, what you think is the optimal way for everyone to be using AI to make all these industries better. What we see now with people integrating the OpenAI API in amazing ways everywhere and as the models get smarter and smarter, having that just continually lift up what the products and services are capable of, that's just going to keep going. Um, so this one, I think we can answer with some, some confidence. What have been some of the kind of unexpected surprises so far, uh, either within the use of the API or, or investments um, of the various directions of, of enablement, amplification, or other um, I know that one of the things that comes from networks and platforms is some things that you're expecting, some things you expect don't happen, and then other things you just completely, like, I never thought of that. What are some of the, I've never thought of that, or or was that was a surprise that that's so soon? Well, I'll tell you on the platform abuse side, with GPT-3, the thing we expected to be the most sort of desired abuse vector was misinformation. We thought that's what everyone was going to do. And so we put all of our effort into like really making sure that we could monitor for it, that we could see what was happening. And in reality, uh, the single most common abuse vector was medical spam. So making advertisements or various drugs. And so there's something about this sort of the shape of the technology, how it fits in, how people want to use it. It's very different from what you would expect. And we've actually seen this even in terms of our product development, you know, like we're the API came from, where ChatGPT came from, both came from this place of like literally for the, like Sam remembers as well, but we spent like, I don't know, like a couple months just writing down all the different ideas that we could work on for both GPT-3 and for GPT-4 of like, maybe we could do a medical thing or a legal thing. And for each of these, it just felt like we'd have to give up on the AGI dream, right? We could become a company selling to hospitals, but like you really got to get serious about being a company selling to hospitals. And that's what you, you, you are. And so we were like, you know what, maybe other people can figure out how to use this technology. And this is totally backwards from how you're supposed to do it. As a startup, you're supposed to have a problem to solve, not a technology in search of a solution. And that I think my conclusion from the fact it seems to be working is that I think AI might just be different from that because it's like every company, every, you know, individual, like every business is a language business. It has language flows deeply baked in. So if you can add a little bit of value in existing language workflows, then it will just be able to be adopted so broadly. What do you think will be some of the areas of scientific development? We've obviously seen various protein folding and other things, but what, what will be some of the three to 10 years of science acceleration from using AI or the, the modern AI techniques? Well, I have a Fit the answer for you, which is that uh, Terrence Tao recently said that uh, uh, GPT-4 has sped him up, uh, you know, his famous mathematician, um, and it takes away all the tedium of like writing grants and like a lot of the things that people actually spend their time on. And so I actually think that there's going to be a lot of this mundane, like you just realize that the world's brightest minds are spending all their time wading through this like, you know, sort of, you know, not very desirable, not very intellectually stimulating work. And I think that we're just going to see people achieving more ap across the board. Yeah, that that's definitely my strongest answer right now. I, we may find that it's really good at other things, but the fact that it is this productivity multiplier for basically everyone uh, will make our best scientists much better. And that will be the way that science speeds up a lot. Now, eventually, probably these systems can help us hold more knowledge in one brain, for lack of a better word, than a human can and discover new connections, new ideas, whatever. But what we're seeing right now is already so impressive. And just, and just to add to that, I think that one thing we have not seen yet from this technology is really coming up with new ideas. And we've seen a little hint of it, right? You go look at AlphaGo, you know, there's a famous move that no human would ever play and that that was something that humans then got a bunch of insight into how to change the game. We saw the same thing with Dota, where we went, we beat the world champions and they actually had been having a poor season that year. 
And afterwards, they went on to win the world championship again, first time ever in that in that game, using strategies that looked a lot like the open AI strategies. And so I think this idea of being able to learn from the machine, that's something that we haven't really seen yet from the GPTs and could be something that will unlock a lot of potential benefits. All right, let's move to rapid fire. Is there a movie, song, or book that fills you with optimism for the future? Greg? Uh, I mean, look, I thought that her, the movie, was was uh, very interesting. It's very hard to find positive depictions of AI in Hollywood. And I think her is like as good as it gets from the, from the Hollywood perspective. But I think we can do better. Uh, I think that we're really going to be able to do something that's just an amazing, amazing world. I didn't want to give the same answer I always give to this question, but I thought about it more. And I think it is just like the right answer at the beginning of infinity. Like super cliche, but hard to be more optimistic than for me than that book. Awesome. And Greg, I just rewatched her. It's so great. <laughs> I'm with you. In this case, we'll start with Greg. Where do you see progress or momentum outside of your industry that inspires you? Uh, energy. I, I love watching Helion, honestly. Like I think that anyone who has a shot on goal of just delivering a super hard technological breakthrough that can unlock a better future, like that has my support. That, that's what I would say too. I think that is the second most exciting thing in the world right now by far. I, I do think also, obviously, there's a long list here, like mRNA and, you know, a whole bunch of other things, but I agree with, um, you know, uh, energy and Helion and a number of others as well. Well, now I feel like I know your answers to the last question, but I was going to ask, uh, what technology are you excited to for its ability to transform your field? But I feel like AI is actually transforming all the other fields. Um, but Sam, is there a technology that you're watching that you're like, this is going to do it all for uh, for AI? Man, I hate to be so boring, but if Helion really works and we can power large data centers, that would be that would be cool. I mean, I can't wait till next year. You told us there's a surprise coming and I'm excited about it. There's a long, there's a long gap between a scientific demo and something that is reliable. So uh, last rapid fire, I think tomorrow marks the one month since GPT-4 launched. For each of you, uh, starting with Sam, fondest memory of this last month? Uh, actually, the moment that we launched. Uh, the, you know, a bunch of us were in the OpenAI cafeteria together. There was like a little countdown clock. We had been working on this for like more than a year. And there were all these like last minute little things that came up, but uh, it was just like a extremely fun team spirit moment. Yeah, the, fu the funny thing for me is I actually love the launch process. Like at this point, you know, like one thing I reflected on at some point is I've done so many launches across the years between Stripe, OpenAI, you know, Dota, you're in the, an arena full of 20,000 fans that are, you know, cheering or, you know, booing for your AI. Um, and that I think that each one, each launch you do is just so different, right? There's, there's just something new to learn. And so for, for GPT-4, uh, I just really enjoyed the process of producing that blog post with the team. Like there's just so much that you just think really hard about what is it that we did? Why did we do it this way? Wait, does this actually make sense? And really figuring that story and how it all fits together in a package that is understandable and really conveys both the strengths and the weaknesses and, you know, your hopes and your dreams and, you know, the any places that it didn't quite pan out. And so I just really enjoy that process of just like really thinking hard about reality and write it down in a, in a way that's digestible. Before um, we might close, anything in particular that you think that the general media discourse needs to be corrected about? When it comes to AI, I mean, you know, some of our questions are obviously on that, which is think about the amazing future you can build towards and don't just linger on, you know, potential science fiction badnesses. But anything that, that generally speaking is like, look, pay attention here and don't get overly distracted by this. So I have two points. One is this question of where the progress comes from. A lot of the focus has been on these large scale ups. But I actually think that they're more of a sign of progress than a driver of progress. And they are the useful artifacts, so it is something that is worth paying attention to. But that really this like compute data algorithms, those have been progressing and continue to progress at sort of across the industry. And that I think one source of potential risk is overhangs. Like the more that it's possible if you were to put these things together, but you haven't actually done it, 
to produce something that's just like totally going to be a step function for society. Like that's where I start to get nervous. You know, for me, even the fact of seeing the reaction to chat GPT and how much it felt to people, it came out of nowhere. Whereas we've had years of seeing this technology get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. The model in chat GPT, that wasn't new. That had been out for almost a year at that point. And so I think that there's something here about this continuity of really figuring out how we as a society, as an industry, as a world, as a species can coordinate, but you got to like really delve into the details of the technology to really figure out where the right places are to pay attention to say, Hey, we should all work together in this way. And I think that if you're, if you're naive about it, if you're, if you don't quite get that right, you can actually have more negative impact than positive. And I think a second piece that people just don't talk about enough, I think, is really thinking about where does humanity need help? And like one example to think about is is specialization, right? That if you go to a doctor, like I remember I had a wrist injury at one point and I wasn't using my wrist and I started to have neck pain. And I asked the doctor, hey, any idea what this might be? And he looked at me, he's like, I'm a wrist doctor. (laughs) He was not going to answer my neck question. And we need to have the way out. We need to have a way to cross specialize, to actually pool knowledge across these disciplines. And AI, that is the essence of an AGI, is the ability to do that, to learn new things and to go into to new areas and figure things out. And so I think that there's a tool that we are missing, sort of a, 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 a capability that society needs. And I think really leaning into where are the gaps and how can we fill them is as important as saying, where are we accidentally filling things that we don't want to right now? I love talking with both Greg and Sam. Um, And even though I've obviously been working with them for years and know a bunch of how they think, they invent, they they create the future, they create what's possible, it's still really interesting and useful to how they're thinking about, you know, anything that runs from how you're improving education to, uh, you know, kind of the the questions about like, how do we do science acceleration and how do we, how do we navigate this future? It's just always such a good reminder. You think open AI launches seven years later, GPT-4 comes out like such a straight line makes so much sense. And so it's so great to hear from Sam and Greg. Oh, in the beginning, we didn't know what the solution would be. We didn't know if it was going to be LLMs. We were trying things out. We had spare compute back then that we just threw problems at. And so like thinking about all of those different iterations that got them where they are today, it's like no surprise that there's up and downs on a startup journey, but it's still surprising to hear from the founders and have them talk about and the different things they tried. And they had three things on the list and, oh, the first one worked. And it was, you know, I, I'm still ready for two and three. I still want to know what else they got uh, got in the back ready to deploy. And I think another thing that was really helpful by the conversation was sharing in very brass tacks how this innovation journey works. It's like, look, we were doing robotics. We were doing, you know, the hand and how to make them. But then it was just moving too slow. It just wasn't working that function. And we had to refocus our efforts on the things that would really make a difference. Um, And that trying a bunch, some of it works. You double down on it. Some of it doesn't work. You refactor um, is a part of the innovation story. And it's what, you know, everyone needs to learn. So often the mistake of understanding of innovation is like you can plan it and it works exactly to plan like a construction project, like building a house or something else. And actually, in fact, it's moving fast and experimenting and trying things. And by the way, occasionally like, whoop, that didn't work. And oh, wow, we had all this spare compute and we tried it and it really worked. Let's do more. I loved the way they thought about safety being so important, but also getting it into the hands of people. They wanted millions of people to be kicking the tires with ChatGPT so they could get it better, so they could make it more safe, so that people could be using it in innovative and incredible ways that they couldn't even dream of. It's like, let's let other folks decide how we can use this incredible tool for all the positive things that are going to happen. One of the things I loved about hearing about the future use cases for AI is that there's so many things that middle class people or upper class people in our country and around the world have access to that folks who don't have as much money don't have access to. And so when Greg talked about, oh, think about people facing eviction, they don't have access to the legal services that other folks might have. 
And with ChatGPT or GPT-4, we can actually expand um, justice. We can expand legal services to hundreds of millions of people. And I think that is the true wish here. You know, as Reed mentioned in the episode, how can we bring the billions of people around the world into the middle class and have the same middle class access to food, housing, justice, legal representation um, as other folks have. And so that to me is the real dream of AI. And it was just, it was really exciting to see that Greg and Sam are thinking about it. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network, hosted by me, Reed Hoffman, and R.A. Finger. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Edie Allard and Sarah Schleed. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Teresa Lopez, Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sapieva, Ian Alice, Greg Beato, and Ben Rellis.